Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. We bless your name for the privilege we always have to gather together with other children of God around the Word of God. And every time we come, you reveal to us deep things and great things in your Word. And we know that today is not going to be an exception. You reveal yourself to us. You reveal your mind to us. You strengthen your children by the study of your word in Jesus' name. As we read these scriptures, Lord, we pray that the deep things revealed in your word are reserved for us. You teach and bring every one of us into it in Jesus' name. We pray for those who are going through persecution, those who are suffering affliction one way or the other, that through the study of your word you will strengthen them and you will stand firm in the faith in Jesus' name. That the persecution or the suffering, instead of weakening them, will strengthen them and help them to fulfill your will in their lives in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that whatever the devil may do, and whatever men, wicked men may do to your children, will not cancel your purpose and plans for their lives. But like you helped Joseph in all his suffering to still fulfill your will, you help all your children, Lord, that everything you plan for them will still be fulfilled in the midst of the sufferings in Jesus' name. Hold the hands of all your people. Hold us so steady that none of us will fall. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. We still come to our study of first epistle of Peter. It's a very enriching study, as you would have observed from the two studies we have had already. Today we come to a third study and we're looking at chapter 1 of 1 Peter, verses 1, verses 6 through 9. 1 Peter, please open your Bible. We're looking at it from chapter 1, from verse 6, all through to verse 9. I'll read to you. When ye greatly rejoice, do now for a season, if need be, ye in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith be more precious than of gold, that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, ye love, in whom do now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. As we look at those verses I've just read to you, you'll see what we call the paradox of the Christian life. What we mean by paradox is two things together here that you do not find, you do not expect they should be together. For example, it talks about greatly rejoicing, although they were passing through manifold temptations. And then it talks of the trial of their faith. It says that is more precious than that of gold. And then it says that that trial, even though it appears to have tried by fire, it will be found to the honor and to the praise and to the glory of God. And then it says, you've not seen him, yet you love him. And even though you have not seen him, yet you are rejoicing with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And it says, as a result of all that believing, though you have not seen him, you are receiving already the result and the climax of your faith, the, 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 the end of your faith, which is your salvation. When we look at the Christian life, it appears that there are a lot of paradoxes in the Christian life. The people of the world can't understand how we Christians can be glad even though we ought to be sad. They do not understand that in the same heart dwells sadness and gladness. But it is so. On the one hand, it may appear that the believer is sad because of many things around him. And yet, when you look deep into his heart, there's joy and gladness there. The passage we have looked at tells us four clear things that uh, you may want to put down. It's not on your outline. Number one, you have heaviness through temptation, and yet, on the other hand, you have happiness in the truth. Those two things in the minds of the world do not go together. Heaviness and happiness. And, and yet, it's the experience of the believer that those things actually go together. Number two, you are tried with fire, and yet, you are trusting in faith. 
when the people of the world when they have their little little troubles they give up some of them even commit suicide but for the believers you are tried with fire yet you are trusting in faith number three although you are sorrowful because of crisis some conflictions some conflicts happen some things uh, actually that bring commotion or confusion into the lives of ordinary people may happen in your life and so ordinarily we expect you to be sorrowful and yet instead of having sorrow because of crisis you're satisfied in christ you say it's the best place for me to be and what i'm going through i know the wisdom of god is moderating everything number four there is persecution from the world and at the same time you're having peace in the lord that is the paradox of the christian life heaviness and happiness trial and yet uh, you are triumphant and then it says you are sorrowful but you are satisfied you are being persecuted but the peace of god that passes understanding is right there in your heart and then peter goes on to say although they had not seen christ physically yet they loved him in fact they loved him so much that they were willing to suffer for his sake they had not seen his gracious glorious face as peter had seen the lord and yet they loved him as much as peter loved the lord they had received his salvation and they had known him by that inner knowledge of spiritual communion that means they had forsaken their sins they have forsaken the world they had come to the lord they received him as their personal savior the experience of that salvation the fellowship in that salvation, the joy in that salvation makes them to forget every other thing around them. Actually, they had learned to love him even above all the people they could see in the physical. They received and enjoyed the blessings that were promised to those who had not seen the Lord and yet they had believed on him. Salvation then is a reality. We're told that we're saved by, by grace, are we saved through faith, redeemed by Christ, we're reconciled with God, and then we go on rejoicing, even though there might be persecution, there might be suffering, and yet the joy of the Lord is there. It develops actually the Christian character and the Christian conviction that is in Christ. We're not in heaven yet, and yet the joy of the Lord, which is a foretaste of the joy of heaven, is already in our heart. Even now, those who are true Christians, they behold the glory of the Lord as in a glass. And beholding that were changed into the same image from glory unto glory. That is like a summary of what we're going to look at today. As we're going to see three points, three elements in our study today. It's on your outline number one. Rejoicing while enduring manifold temptations. Actually, these things we study, they will show the evidence of those who are really born again. If you are really born again, your attitude in persecution, your attitude in suffering, your attitude, when things don't go exactly the way you expected, your attitude and disposition at such a time will show the genuineness of your Christian experience. Number two, refining through the experience of many trials. Many young combats are wondering and asking why. Why should we suffer? Why should we be persecuted? Why should all these things go on in our lives? The Lord permits all those things in his wisdom so that you can be refined and purified. Refining through the experience of many trials. Number three, the reward and the joy and the glory after earthly troubles. Reward, joy, glory after earthly troubles. Let's come back to number one. Rejoicing while enduring manifold temptations we're looking at first peter chapter one again but six it says wherein ye greatly rejoice though now for a season if need be ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations the question many people will be asking is is it really possible that joy should live side by side in the same heart or sorrow Yes, it is possible because that was the very experience of the believers that Peter was writing to. They were ex they extremely the joy and yet persecution and suffering were there. Actually, we need to remind ourselves that persecution is indispensable and that suffering is an integral part of the Christian life. And yet there is an abiding peace within the heart of the believer while he may be going through that persecution without it's like when you look at the sea, the depths of the sea, 
be the still and peaceful while the winds rave and the waves and the, and the currents roar on the surface. That means sorrow on the surface, heaviness on the surface, persecution on the surface, the pain on the surface, and yet the joy and the peace at that same time deep in the heart. And so it is possible, as uh, Paul the Apostle puts it, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And uh, we need to tell ourselves, remind uh, old uh, believers, as well as uh, the new converts, that uh, persecution is a part of the Christian life. In Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 12, it says, yes, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It says all. When you are born again, you are born into a life of godliness. And if you really follow through on the practical life of godliness, there are many people around you in the world that are not godly. They do not desire to be godly. They do not love godliness. And because of the difference between you and them, they are going to react against the godly lifestyle that you are living. And they are going to react with opposition that is going to cause you persecution and suffering. That's why it says, all that will live godly, it doesn't matter whether you are a teenager, you are a student, you are a young fellow, or you are a married person, you are an adult, a father or a mother. If you are living godly, there will be persecution attracted unto that life of godliness. But that persecution doesn't need to take your joy away. It doesn't need to take the peace of God in your life away. In fact, the Bible makes it very clear in that passage I read to you that none of us will be exempted from persecution and suffering. And so whenever those things come, you know there is a reason why that thing shall come. And you know it's just for a time. Look, come back to First Peter chapter 1 and in verse 6. You'll see some words there that we shouldn't overlook. It says, when ye greatly rejoice, do now... For the season is not forever. Persecution, suffering, the pain will not continue forever. For the season. And then it says, if need be. The Lord regulates everything. He moderates everything. He knows that there is a need be in your life, in my life. Before he will permit that persecution. And it says, because of that, you are in heaviness through the manifold trials, troubles, and temptations that you are going through. When those events do come into our lives, a great love for Christ, an assurance of future reward, and the glory that we're going to experience shall add gladness to our, to our sadness. The heart that is united to Christ will have an inward solemn peace and joy, which no tempest of sorrow can extinguish. And look at the word of God and, and have the assurance and uh, see what it says. Uh, it tells us that the persecution will come. And it tells us what the attitude should be when those persecutions come. In First Peter chapter 4 verse 13, it says, But rejoice. That's an imperative. That means it's a commandment. Uh, you, you don't even have a choice. It says there is just one attitude to manifest when you are going through the suffering, the persecution, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering. Our kind of suffering is not the kind of suffering the people of the world that they go through. We're not suffering because of sin. We're not suffering because we're evildoers. We're not suffering because we have done wrong. We're suffering because uh, the Pharisees don't like that we're standing with Christ. The Sadducees don't appreciate that we're standing with the Lord. Because of that, we're suffering the suffering of Christ. And it says that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. That means we suffer with him here and we shall reign with him. We shall be glorified with him when he comes. And of course, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Master, our Savior and Redeemer, he assured us before he went away that the persecution will actually come, the suffering will actually come. In John chapter 16, verse 33, it says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but in the but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. It says, in the world ye shall have tribulation, but we are saved, but we are born again. Oh Lord, why should you allow us to have tribulation, trials, and troubles in the world? 
Well, it has a purpose. Number one, when you suffer in the world, it makes you to long for heaven. It makes you to desire heaven. When the children of Israel, when they were suffering in Egypt, then they remember the promised land and they began to groan. They began to cry unto the Lord. Oh Lord, when shall it be? If they felt totally convenient all through their years in Egypt, there will be no desire and no longing in them to go to the land of Canaan. That's why the Lord sometimes permits and allows that we have some of these troubles and trials in the world here but he said be of good cheer because i have overcome the world let me ask you a question and that thing that he said in the world ye shall have tribulation did those disciples of jesus that were in the immediate presence of christ when he spoke those words did they actually experience that yes they did and what was their attitude did they were they of good cheer did they actually rejoice oh yes they did look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, from verse 14. And to him they agreed, that is, Gamaliel told them, leave them alone, let them continue. If this sin be of God, you will not be able to destroy it. But if it's not of God, the thing will come to naught eventually. And then it says to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, that's the suffering, that's the persecution, uh, one that's a pain they laid upon them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, ever and, to, and they let them go. And he departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing. That's the word. They were beaten. They had pains. It was persecution. It caused them suffering. And yet it says, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. But did they stop preaching the gospel? Did they stop believing what they had believed? Did they stop taking their stand on what the Lord had taught them? It says in verse 42, and daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not, they didn't stop to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. That should be the attitude of the believer today. That should be your attitude uh, when you are suffering persecution. That should be your attitude. And the persecution may come in various ways. Uh, you may, for example, lose uh, your job. You may not get all the money you are looking for. And it may be because of your Christian stand that those situations come upon your life but you should rejoice in the lord in habakkuk chapter 3 habakkuk chapter 3 verse 17 although the fig tree shall not blossom neither shall the fruit be in the vines the labor of the olive shall fail and it says the fields shall not yield shall yield no meat the flock shall be cut off from the fold and there shall be no herd in the stores. You see negative, negative, negative situations there, conditions there. And yet look at the attitude of the prophet. He said, yet in verse 18, will I rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. And he will make my feet like hands feet. And he will make me to walk upon mine high places. Which means then the joy shall continue. You should keep on rejoicing in the Lord, even though for a season, now if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations and trials. Uh, it appears that uh, things are not the way you expected them to be. Don't cry because of that. Don't give up because of that. Don't backslide because of that. Don't commit suicide because of that. Don't turn it up because of that. Rejoice in the Lord. And like things change for Joseph, it will change for you also in Jesus' name. In Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. You understand that? For righteousness' sake. It's, uh, the believer is not suffering because he's a murderer. He's not suffering because of abortion. He's not suffering because of worldliness. He's not suffering because he went to the football field and then they routed over there and broke his head. He's not suffering because he, he embezzled money. He's not suffering because he colluded with some people and cheated his uh, place of work. And now they are punishing him because of... That's not the kind of thing we're talking about. It says, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake we're talking to believers those who are born again the children of god practical righteousness and holiness we find in their lives because of the righteousness because of the holiness in their lives they suffer persecution and it says they are blessed if they are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven in verse 11 blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you for 
my sake not for the sake of covetousness not for the sake of anything you've done which is evil rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted the prophets that were before you and so you find here that the Christian is being told that although there is persecution, although that uh, things are not going the way they ought to be because you are a Christian, you will not say, well, if I were not a Christian, all these will, things will not be happening. Maybe it's better for me to quit. Maybe it's better for me to backslide. And then I can go and enjoy the things in the world. Well, the people of the world, they suffer too, but there's nobody to comfort them. When you uh, suffer as a result of your Christian stand, rejoice in the Lord. I have a question here. How is it that we rejoice in our trials? What makes us to rejoice in our trials? What helps us? What are the considerations that help us to rejoice in our trials? Number one, you look unto Jesus who suffered for you. You are suffering a little. And it's a little that you are suffering for Christ's sake. Then you say, wait a minute. Why should I bother about this? Why should I worry about this? Christ suffered for me, and the suffering he suffered for me is a hundred times, a thousand times, a million times, a billion times, more than what I'm suffering now. When you consider it that way, you will rejoice and say this suffering is nothing. There's another reason. When you remember that others like you, believers like you, in the same community like you, they have suffered greater persecution than you are going through now and they suffer triumphantly then you will rejoice and say this is nothing in fact people like me brothers like me sisters like me they went through this triumphantly the same god that gave them grace to overcome will give me will give you grace to overcome in jesus name number three is that you trust in the wisdom of god who you see, when you, when you understand that God himself, he knows about this, and he has permitted this, and God cannot do evil, then you know that the wisdom of God has permitted it for your good. You say, I don't see the good now. I don't see what is going to come out of this, but I know that God has a good purpose in mind for permitting it. Because, uh, because of that, you rejoice. Number four, you are meditating on the fact that gain is always greater than pain gain is always greater than pain the persecution is painful the suffering is painful but you know that today's gain is greater than yesterday's pain look at the woman that is laboring to have a child the labor pains are great we understand it's very very painful but when the child eventually comes out that baby that is born is greater than the pain she has gone through when you meditate on the fact that uh, the present gain is uh, greater than the past pain and the future gain will be greater than the present pain then you are going to rejoice and say this is nothing this is nothing it's like the labor pains i'm going through and when the child is born eventually and the reward is given to me eventually then i know that they uh, have joy unspeakable full of glory number five you are thinking of the reward that you are going to get on high the lord is allowing you to pass through those things because no cross no crown and a little cross little crown great cross and great crown and because the lord wants you to be crowned when you get over there in eternity that's why it's allowing you now to have all those things the crisis and the conflict and the cross that you have in your life and then you are rejoicing you say i carry my cross and even smile i carry my cross and even rejoice because i know that this carrying of the cross will eventually usher me into the glory of the lord and it's going to be wonderful on that final day when the lord will wipe away all your tears and then he will reward you abundantly in jesus name so we understand what the Lord is telling us. He's telling us that we should joyfully endure persecution and suffering, rejoicing while enduring manifold temptations. We come to number two now. In number two, we're reading in First Peter chapter one verse seven. First Peter chapter one verse seven. That the trial of your faith, being more precious than of gold that perisheth though it be tried with fire might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of jesus christ you see here peter is talking uh, uh, confidently about the coming of the lord he said the lord is coming all that you are going through now is just for a time eternity will come and you're going to be rewarded in eternity and it says 
your faith is tried now. Your Christian stand is tried now. Uh, your steadfastness is tried now. What you say you believe, and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, is tried now. It's like it's tried with fire. Like gold is tried with fire. But then when the Lord will come, it will be found to the praise, to the glory, to the honor of the Lord at the appearing of Jesus Christ. He's talking about the time of the rapture. He's saying that the time will, uh, will, will not be long. The Lord himself will come. And when the Lord comes, although you are refined by fire now, persecuted as by fire now, tried as by fire now, melted as by fire now, it will be to the glory of God at that final day. He's making use of an illustration, the illustration of melting metal. So that you can form that metal into the kind of instrument you want. If you have seen a blacksmith before, or goldsmith before, if uh, they are going to make a particular uh, instrument, uh, they, they are going to put uh, the thing into the fire, and then they put the fire on, they put the heat on, it melts that metal, and then when the metal is melted, then they can fashion it to the kind of instrument they want to make. That's exactly what the Lord does. Malachi tells us in chapter 3, Malachi chapter 3, verse 3. Malachi 3, verse 3. And it shall see it as a refiner and purifier of silver. And it shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver uh, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Do you see here, he had chosen the Levites, but in their natural self, they will not be able to offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. He needed to cleanse them. He needed to purge them. He needed to purify them. The purifying and the purging was to make them that they will be able to offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. That's telling us the purpose of that refining fire. When the Lord allows that persecution, when the Lord allows that uh, suffering to come upon us, and you're saying, God, where are you? He says, I'm here. I'm watching over the persecution. I'm watching over the suffering. All that you are going through is not strange to me. I have a purpose in this. I've chosen you as one of the sons of Levi. And I'm doing this so that you'll be so purged, you'll be so cleansed, you'll be so purified, and then you will offer unto me a better sacrifice and a better service in Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 3. The refining pot is for silver, and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tried tries the heart. It's telling us that uh, uh, when you want to purify the silver, you want to purify the gold, then you put it in the refining pot and you turn on the heat until it is melted. And the Lord says it tries the heart in that way. It's telling us that the trial of faith and the manifold temptations we're going through, which will definitely come, it may bring heaviness, it may bring sorrow, but they are meant to refine us. They are meant to purge us. They are meant to purify us. As fire tests and purifies gold, so trials test and purify the believer. It purifies our character. It purifies the faith of the Christian. God tried and tested Abraham. God tried and tested Job and many others. Their trials made them stronger in their faith and in their trust in the Lord. And the same thing our trials should do. The same thing our troubles and tribulations should do. Our trials come to make us stronger in the Lord. In refining gold, the heat is turned on until the gold is melted. It actually becomes like liquid. And then the refiner will see his reflection, his picture in the melted gold. That's exactly what God is doing. When the persecution is on, God is very near. In fact, he's presiding over those trials and those afflictions. He regulates the heat. He removes the dross. He removes all the impurities. And he keeps on the heat. He keeps on that uh, fire until he can see the reflection, the image of his, of his only begotten son in your very life. That's the reason he allows all those things in your life. So when you are going through a trial, don't think God has forsaken me. He has not forsaken you. He's still very near. He's supervising everything. And everything at the last will be for your good in Jesus' name. Trials are part of the necessary training and discipline of sonship. Are you having trial and you find you think it's painful? Oh, yes, it's painful. 
as fire is painful to the body, so trials are painful to the soul. Because those trials, they search us. And they consume whatever is consumable in our lives. And sometimes the trials may even seem unbearable. Ask Joseph. There might have been a point in his uh, persecution when he thought, this is not fair. This is not right. This is unbearable. How is it they just took me and threw me into Egypt? How is it they just took me and my father doesn't know where I am now? How is it they told that big lie against me and it landed me in prison and there is nobody to care for me? But you understand, he came from that prison and he went right to the throne. The Lord has a purpose. He is still moderating everything, guiding everything that the original vision and dream that he had for your life, through that persecution, through that trial, you will climb to the throne in Jesus' name. Maybe you want to ask uh, David. You ask David, he had been anointed as king. What had he done? He, even after the anointing as a king, he went in chapter 17 of 1 Samuel and he killed Goliath. Everybody in Israel was happy. But Saul became jealous persecution came he was running from here to there and uh, he, he was almost weary of his life but all those things were training for him he was trained until eventually he became a king even Saul himself said David I know you are going to reign and when you become a king please remember me and don't wipe away my house from Israel therefore you understand from the example of uh, David and the example of Joseph and the examples of many other people that whatever you are going through now now, in their same life, the Lord will promote you in Jesus' name. And so it may bring heaviness now. It is blessed heaviness because it is going to end in joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. That means our trials, our temptations, if we endure them patiently and we bear them meekly, will refine us, will purify us, it will purify our character, take self-confidence away, take all the things of the world away, make us humble make us uh, distrustful of ourselves, make us only leaning upon the Lord, trusting only in the Lord, and then it will do what it ought to do in every one of our lives. Look at Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 9. And see what the Lord is still saying concerning the refining, concerning the persecution, concerning the suffering that the children of God may go through. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 9. And I will bring the thought part uh, through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined. I will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. And I will say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. And so you understand that it has a purpose and a purpose will be fulfilled in Romans chapter 5. Romans, an important passage, please open your Bible. Romans chapter 5, we're looking at it from verse 1. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's talking about believers who are justified. Our sins are taken away, and we are names and the book of life, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, uh, wherein uh, we, uh, we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now listen to verse 3. And not only so, but with glory in tribulations also. Knowing that tribulations worketh patience. Please uh, note that. I'll come back to that. And patience experience. And experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. You will see the connection here. There is no full stop after verse 3, after verse 4, until after verse 5. Which means tribulations are there, troubles are there, trials are there. But then it says it will bring a series of things into our lives. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And then patience will lead to experience. And then experience will lead to hope. And hope maketh not ashamed. It's starting from the time of your suffering, the time of the persecution. I will say, I'm ashamed of myself. People are saying that although you say you are a Christian, you say you are a child of God, look at what you are going through. It brings shame into my life. No, it doesn't bring shame. That tribulation, that trouble, it has a purpose. It's going to work something. That thing is going to link with another thing. And that one will link with another thing on Till it brings hope. I'll summarize uh, that after reading two more passages to you. Let us look at Hebrews. 
Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10, here he tells us, still talking about, uh, you know, this chastisement or persecution or whatever it is. For verily, uh, for a few days, chastened us, they chastened us after their own pleasure. But he, for our profit, uh, that uh, we might be made partakers of his holiness. He tells us that chastisement may come, suffering may come, persecution may come, troubles and trials may come, but there is a purpose because eventually it's for our profit and will be partakers of his holiness. I'll summarize after reading now for Peter chapter 5 verse 10. For Peter chapter 5 verse 10. Here we are told, it says, But God, the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that he has suffered a while, there's suffering here, there's persecution here, after he has suffered for a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. You would have come across some, uh, some words beginning with P, as I read from Romans chapter 5, and I read to you from Hebrews chapter 12, and I've read now from uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. Let me summarize. Whenever these things are in our lives, and uh, we have persecution, we have pain, we have suffering, we have tribulation, we have troubles, we have trials, and sometimes it even brings tears from our eyes. But you know, those tears, they purify. Those tears, they make you actually better. Here are the things they produce in your life. Number one, patience. If you are a person that has been very aggressive and you are almost always in a hurry and you are impatient with everything and everybody, when those things, when they come in your life, it makes you go slowly. It brings patience in your life. Number two, it brings purity. Because it says that through those uh, sufferings, it will bring, uh, will be partakers of his holiness. It actually purifies us. It purges us. It refines us. It takes the dross and the impurities away from our life. Number three, it brings pity for other people. You know, if you have never suffered, you really don't understand what suffering means. But after you have gone through it yourself, if you have gone through sickness, if you have gone through some pains, and then you know how you felt when you were going through nothing. Anytime you hear that somebody is suffering, somebody is sick, oh, you feel, you remember the way you suffered. You remember what you went through. You have pity for that person. You will go to that person and you will say, how are you feeling now? Because you've gone through it and you understand. So number one, it brings patience, it brings purity, it brings pity for other people. Number four, it brings prayerfulness. Many, many times, when there is no trouble, we don't pray enough. We just, uh, you know, live our lives. We wake up in the morning, have 10 minutes quiet time and pray and say, Lord, thank you. I'm always healthy. No problem at all. I thank you since I was born again. It's like, you know, the world is made for me. The promises are mine. No problem at all. Thank you. I'm going out now. Go with me now. And when I come back, I'll be praising your name. Five minutes, you are through. But when suffering is there and persecution is there and the world is frowning at you and everybody around it, it appears that something is wrong somewhere then you stay longer on your knees say lord why is this i need grace i need your strength i need your power then you search your bible you are looking for the promises of god because you know those uh, problems and the pain in your life is driving you closer and closer to the lord those things are good suffering is good persecution is good because it makes you to become more prayerful number five it brings perseverance in your life that's endurance you're able to remain steadfast in the lord it is that time you have con your convictions go deep in the lord the convictions you had before the persecution will make you to examine it again and uh, the stand you are taking the things you had abandoned the things you have given up you say i don't want to suffer just for nothing is it right i gave up this is it right because i gave up this is it right i gave up this when you are suffering for your Christian stand, you examine that Christian stand, and then you say, yes, it says it's real. It's true. This is what the Lord wants me to do. And it is a good fight of faith. It gives you perseverance. Number six, it gives you power with God. Power with God. Because now, you are very familiar with God. You know God now. You talk to God more now. The promises of God are real to you now. The grace of God is very fresh in your life now.
now it gives you power with god eventually is going to also give you a promotion because the lord promoted shadrach meshach and abednego it was when they went through that fire the lord then promoted them and then uh, second first peter chapter 5 and in verse uh, 10 it tells us it gives us perfection perfection it perfects us it says after you have suffered for a while he'll make you perfect and establish and strengthen and settle you don't uh, give up because you're suffering don't regret because you're suffering actually it gives you patience it gives you purity it makes you have pity on other people it develops your prayer life it makes you have perseverance it gives you power with god it gives you spiritual promotion and then it's going to eventually give you uh, perfection and the lord will keep you you will not fall during that time of trial in jesus name in jude verse 24 now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior, the glory and majesty and dominion and power, both now and ever. And the people of God said, Amen. We go to point number three now. is a reward and the joy and the glory after earthly troubles. We come to first Peter. First Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Here the uh, Spirit of God through Peter is telling us that uh, although we have not seen the Lord face to face, yet there is, a, there is a promise that the Lord has given us that although we have not seen him, when we believe, we have a special blessing. It's in John chapter 20, John chapter 20, verse 29. John 20, verse 29, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those people that have not seen the Lord Jesus Christ in the physical, in the natural, yet they have believed. And uh, all of us here yeah, were like that. We were not there when Jesus walked the shores of Galilee, when he lived in Nazareth, when he performed all those miracles in Capernaum, but we have read about it. And the Spirit of God has interpreted that to our hearts. And we believe the Lord. And Peter is talking about us too when he said, Whom have you not seen, ye love? In whom do you see him not? Yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Thousands, indeed millions of people. There are in every age and in our own time that passionately love the Lord. They have affection for the Lord, attachment to the Lord Jesus Christ since he died for them on the cross of Calvary. Time and distance seem to be powerless it to diminish our love for him. Such love rules the heart and guides the heart. We have not seen him in the physical, but we feel it in our heart. We even love him more than people around us, more than our father, more than our mother, more than our wives, more than our children, more than our husbands. We love the Lord. We see all those other people, our relations every time, but they have not done for us what Jesus has done for us. Jesus died for us. He bore the penalty of our sin for us. And he's going to prepare a place for us in glory. Because of that, we love him above every human being that we may see. The love of God rules our heart and guides our heart. Stimulates us and produces patience in us. And then we're patiently enduring. Why are we patiently enduring? We're patiently enduring because we know the time of the rapture is about, it's about to come. And we know that when the rapture happens, we'll see the Lord face to face. And we even say... Just to, glance, not just to catch a glimpse of the face of the Lord when he comes, that will be enough for all the things that we have gone through. That's why we love him so much, even though we have not seen him in the physical. It brings peace, it brings hope, it brings holiness, it conquers the soul, and it makes us conquer sin, conquer the flesh, and conquer the world. Don't sin, 
yet we love him because he died for each of us and he lives to keep us holy in fellowship with the father and the lord is still asking whether we actually love him whether we are part of the people that uh, peter there is talking about when he said do you you really love the lord even though you have not seen him and you remember when the lord was asking peter the question and that same question the lord is asking you today in john chapter 21 john chapter 21 from verse 15 so when they are dying jesus says unto simon peter simon is gone is not saying unto you he's saying to you today lovest thou me more than these lovest thou the lord more than all the things around you more than your parents more than your children more than wife more than husband lovest thou me more than these do you love him more than life itself do you love him more than gold and silver do you love him more than money do you love him more than all the property all the things in the world lovest thou me more than these and he says unto him yes lord thou knowest that i love thee can we say that together yes lord yes lord yes lord thou knowest that i love thee that's what the lord is expecting from every one of us even though we have not seen him is asking us do you love me more than what you see do you love me what more than what you taste do you love me more than what you can handle do you love me more than all the things around you all the things in the world and if you really love me then that love of god will do something in you and constrain you uh, to actually show that love in a practical way in second corinthians chapter 5 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Because he died for us, there's no greater love than that, that a man should give his life for his friend. And because he loves us so much like that, we will want to give him everything. We want to abandon everything and just concentrate on him with undescribable, indescribable affection. And then it says in verse 15 that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again. Because he died for us, and he rose again for justification and glorification because of that we love him we think about him we meditate on his word and we're willing to give up anything for his sake because of that love that passes description in first john chapter 4 first john chapter 4 in first john chapter 4 here we, we we read from verse 7 beloved let us love one another for for love is of god and everyone that loveth is born of god and knoweth god in verse uh, 8 he that loveth not knoweth not god for god is love in verse 10 herein is love not that we love god but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins because he loved us so much that's the reason he sent his son to be the propitiation uh, that means uh, that the sacrifice for our sins and because of that that's the reason we love him in verse 10 we love him because he first loved us when you consider the love of god and you experience that love of god and you know it is through that love you are now born again you have your name in the book of life and you're expecting that when he comes he'll take you home and you know it is not by merit only because of the love of god you're willing to give up anything and everything really to love the lord to love him with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and everything that you have we we'll come back to first peter chapter one in this study today we have learned uh, something very important where we'll go through persecution maybe you are not being persecuted now but wait it will come or if you are going through it now it will soon come to an end but the lord is telling us that in all those persecutions in all those trials and in all those uh, tribulations and in all those uh, things that you may go through for the sake of christ there is one thing that should be our reaction it should be the joy of the lord wherein he greatly rejoice though now for a season if need be ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations are the trial of your faith being more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found to the praise and the honor and the glory at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. You understand that the persecution and the suffering has a purpose. It's to give you patience and it's to purify you. 
It's to make you have pity on other people. And it is to make you have perseverance. It is to help you so that you'll be prayerful. And it is to give you spiritual promotion to perfect you. Because you know the purpose and the profit of the persecution that you are going through. That's why it doesn't bother, it doesn't worry you. You know it's like Joseph. You know it's like David. And you know it's like all those prophets of old. And as the Lord helped them and they sailed through, you too you will sail through in Jesus' name. Whom have you not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable. That means joy that you cannot express. And then it says full of glory. It's saying that eventually when the Lord will come, because of all the things we have gone through, the joy we're going to have, the glory we're going to have will be so full, it will be the kind of glory that glorified saints will be able to have in the presence of the glorified Christ. And then it says receiving the end of your faith, even on the salvation of your souls if you have not been born again this is your chance for you to give your life to the lord to just come and throw yourself at the feet of christ and say i realize what you've done for me you died for me you gave yourself for me you shed your blood for me you manifested your love for me i want to love you too take all my sins away i want to be born again if you are a child of god now you are born again Think of what you are going to get eventually. Think of the reward you are going to have. If you are having a cross now, you are having some conflicts now, you are having some persecution now, you are going through some sufferings now, it is nothing. When the curtains of life and the curtains of time, when they are drawn, and then you are ushered into eternity, great will be your joy. You'll be in the bosom of the Lord. You'll see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. You'll see the people that overcame and went through. You too will be an overcomer. And all the promises of God made to overcomers will be yours in Jesus' name. And if you are going through a persecution, you can ask the Lord, give me more grace. And the Lord will give you grace. In fact, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, I now understand why I'm suffering. I now understand why the persecution is there. I now understand why the tribulation, the trials are there. It's to purify me. It's not to destroy you. It's to purge me. It's not to destroy you. It's to grant me patience. It's not to destroy you. And it's to make you have pity on other people. It's not to destroy you. It's to refine your character and your life. It's not to destroy you. It's to make you more prayerful. To give you perseverance. Give you power with God. Give you promotion. Spiritual promotion. And it's to give you perfection. It will perfect you eventually. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. Whatever you are going through. Lord I will not give up. Lord, I will not give up. Lord, I will not give up. I know it has a purpose. But make sure you are not suffering because of your sin. Make sure you are not suffering because of immorality. Make sure you are not suffering because you stole money in your place of work. Make sure you are not suffering because of the evil that you have done. Make sure it is for Christ's sake. It's for righteousness sake. You're suffering as a believer. You're suffering because of godliness. Then you know it's going to be profitable. Talk to the Lord before you go. And become a partaker of the righteousness and the holiness of the Lord. You have been blessed. Don't let this message die. Listen to it again and pass it to others. You can get more from God at the Deeper Life Bible Church. Our headquarters is Deeper Life Bible Church, Tagada, Lagos, Nigeria. Blessed are your ears for hearing these things. We'll meet in heaven.
if you do dance.